Hello again. We've been off air for quite a long time, but here we are again with another lockdown special. Uh, since the lockdown has started, I've grown a beard, so you won't recognise me if you see me around the village, but I'm quite looking forward to a visit to Pina to get my hair cut. This programme starts a little series of programmes that I've been working on during the recess. The history of aerial bombing is probably a bit of a specialist subject. It's likely to interest people who are particularly interested in aviation history and the Second World War, but it is part of our island history. And it's a story that we should not forget about. It reminds us of the true horrors that war can create. Several of the recent programmes have mentioned the Butt Report with its particular implied criticism of the Royal Air Force bombing performance in World War II. That phrase, only one bomb in three fell within five miles of the target, has been mentioned quite a few times. So this programme sets the record straight by mentioning what happens to Bomber Command and how it performs after 1941. The significant losses suffered by Bomber Command when supporting the British Expeditionary Force early in World War II quickly led to changes in tactics. Bomber Command was going into France with unescorted bombers which were the old single-engine ferry battles or blenheims and these were being shot down sometimes by squadrons. The enemy aircraft were fast and heavily armed, and the idea that the bomber would always get through had been consigned into the dustbin of history. After Dunkirk, when we were still trying to bomb German cities, the new tactics involved bombers flying individually at night over unfamiliar territory with basic maps and the mathematics of dead reckoning to guide them to, to find the target and to come back. Being alone flying over Germany theoretically made fighter interception more difficult and it also made it more difficult for anti-aircraft fire to hit an individual target. And every aircraft had a navigator so dead reckoning should be easy. Unfortunately the theories were all wrong. Once the Germans had taken over most of Europe, they set up their radar defences on something called the Kamhuber Line. The Kamhuber Line was a set of radar sites that would pick up enemy aircraft as they flew in over the coast, behind which was a set of geographical boxes that were patrolled by a single night fighter aircraft that was guided onto an intruding bomber when it entered the box. The whole setup of German anti-aircraft was set up to deal with individual planes flying over the enemy territory. Fighters would patrol the boxes in the Kamhuber line And when an enemy aircraft was, de was detected, the individual fighter would be alerted by the controllers and get onto its tail. The internal radar of the fighter would then pick up the bomber so it could be shot down. For bombers that got through, dead reckoning was just possible on clear moonlit nights with little wind and good navigation and good waypoints to observe. It was impossible on cloudy, stormy nights with little visibility of the ground. So let's imagine that we've got through the fighter defences and are now flying over Holland. Let's see how good dead reckoning can be in poor conditions. When we took off from Britain, it was a cloudless night with very little wind. 
but the target is Berlin and from where we're currently located that is a distance of 400 miles away directly to the east so the course to target is 90 degrees due east we have an indicated airspeed of 200 miles per hour and we're flying at an indicated height of 18,000 feet this means that we can tell the pilot to fly a course of 90 degrees for two hours and we'll reach our target however since takeoff a thick cloud cover now covers Europe and a wind has come up from the direction of southeast which at 18,000 feet is blowing at a speed of 50 miles per hour we can fly for two hours on our way to Berlin but the wind will actually blow us on this course our actual course is now 65 degrees that is to say east northeast and this is our uncorrected area for bombing an aircraft flying dead reckoning on a cloudy night can easily miss its target by as much as a hundred miles if we can pick up that we're now flying over Mecklenburg instead of Berlin the navigator can make corrections the wind direction is coming from the southeast and the wind at 18,000 feet must be blowing at 50 miles per hour therefore if we fly for 60 minutes at a speed of 200 miles per hour on a course of 135 degrees we'll reach our target over Berlin hmm another hour flying over enemy territory the temptation is to bomb a target of opportunity in the area where we now find ourselves so look for something worthwhile near Mecklesburg go home and claim a successful bombing mission oh yes sir absolutely wizard prang sir total wipeout it's easy to make such a claim to someone who wasn't there but several people in high places become concerned about the extravagant claims being made by bomber command crews especially when the day after a target was supposedly destroyed it was found to be operating perfectly well and manufacturing at its previous rate according to observations and reconnaissance among the skeptics was the prime minister sir winston churchill he asked lord churwell to commission an investigation of bombing performance with the approval of the air ministry and also of the admiralty who were interested in these results Cherwell gives david ben susan butt the task but is a civil servant in the war cabinet secretariat an assistant to lord Cherwell's. Churchill had created the Admiralty Department of Statistics when he was first Sea Lord and Butt is now attached to this department. He is then given the task of assessing 633 target photos and comparing them with crew's claims. This number 633 reminded me of 633 Squadron the fictitious mosquito squadron in the film of that name i wonder if there was some connection between the film and the performance of bomber command up to 1941 just a thought but many senior officers both those flying and those on the staff knew what to expect from butt's report
The navigation and bombing techniques used up to 1941 were simply not fit for purpose. Dead reckoning was never expected to work at night and in bad weather, and in any case, some of the best and most experienced navigators of the Royal Air Force had been lost in the Battle of France and in bomb raids that have been carried out since. Unaided navigation and bomb aiming was obviously made more difficult by the fact that every time you flew over a populated area, there were people on the ground who were trying to shoot you down. And all over Europe, there were people flying in the air who were looking for you so that they could shoot you down. When you're up to your backside in alligators, it is sometimes difficult to remember that your objective is to drain the swamp. So, on August the 18th, 1941, David Ben-Susan Butt presents his report. It is a statistical examination of night photographs taken during the night bombing attacks from June to July of 1941, and it points out the following conclusions. The idea that bomb aiming improves over the French ports is simply because it's easier to navigate a longer coastline to find your target. The drastic reduction in hits over the Ruhr Valley is almost certainly because of improved ground-to-air defences that were concentrated in that area. A full moon obviously gives you better visibility to bomb from, and a new moon operates in almost complete darkness so you can't see the ground at all. The shocking fact is that only one bomb in three being within five miles of the target area is a conclusion that seems to follow from some appallingly bad results listed above. Needless to say, the results were not well received by everyone who read the report. Sir Winston Churchill expressed the results as disappointing. But what led to this situation? What was wrong with Bomber Command's navigation and bomb aiming? And more importantly, can the situation be improved? It was the German Air Service that first developed a strategic bombing arm when the Zeppelins set out to bomb Britain. These lighter than air craft could fly very high and very slowly so that they could loiter over a target area for as long as it took to accurately mark the target and bomb it. They were also flying too high to be attacked by enemy aircraft and our anti-aircraft defences just weren't good enough to reach to those heights. These airship would fly at a height between 16 and 18,000 feet, which was far too high for night defence fighters to reach them, and it was also beyond the range of the present anti-aircraft fire. So they would stooge into the target area, with a bomb aimer looking down through a telescope until he found a target that was worth bombing. As this passed through his bomb site, he would release his bombs and the aircraft would just fly on. Sometimes observation would show that the bombs had actually missed the target and this would be put down to wind blowing the bombs off target as they fell. So the airship simply flew round again. And this time it corrected its aim so that the bombs, as they dropped, would fall onto the target area. You can imagine that over Britain, there was often a thick cloud layer below 16 or 18,000 feet that obscured the target area. The airships had a simple answer for this. They simply dropped a gondola car, which carried a little man 
who was, a, who was in touch with the airship by radio telephone, and he would tell the airship when it was over the target and instruct the bombardier to drop the bombs. It was all very simple. And even when the early bomber aircraft came on the scene with the Gothers and the Stachen Zeppelins, it wasn't that complicated to aim the bombs. You simply cut a hole in the bottom of the aeroplane and the gunner or bombardier could look through the window in the bottom of the fuselage and providing he allowed for the speed and altitude of the aircraft and allowed the bombs to aim off, the target would still be hit. As the aircraft flew over the target, he simply dropped the bombs when the crosshairs were reached and that projected an angle for the bombs to fall that would hit the target below. The aircraft flies towards the target with the bomb aimer looking down and ahead at a given angle. As the target meets the sight line, he releases the bomb and the speed of the aircraft throws the bomb forwards. Gravity takes the bomb onto the target and the aircraft flies away. So how did the Germans actually plan their bombing campaigns in World War II? Germany's main bombers were medium twin-engined aircraft able to carry between 2,000 and 6,000 pounds of bombs. Most of Germany's level bombers were actually designed as passenger aircraft and fast mail carriers and were constructed under the restrictions that followed the First World War. The German Luftwaffe never developed a strategic bomber until it was too late. It required medium bombers dropping single or a few bombs very accurately to support the army's blitzkrieg attacks. The Luftwaffe was really developed as a sort of flying artillery supporting the army's attacks in blitzkrieg. And the best option for this is the dive bomber. So the Germans developed the Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber. Junkers also developed a twin-engined Junkers 88, which was also capable of dive bombing attacks. And these were modeled on the Henschel HS-123, which was a biplane dive bomber that the Germans used in Spain and in the attacks on Poland and in the early attacks on France. How does a dive bomber get its bombing accuracy? Well, the Stuka can dive vertically onto the target. The Stuka then pulls out automatically when it reaches the bomb release point. The pilot often blacks out because of the G-forces in the pullout, but the bomb continues its vertical descent to hit the target. A launcher can throw the bomb outside the propeller arc. The trapeze whips the bomb outside the arc of the propeller, but still allows it to fall vertically onto the target. This means that as the pilot sights the tank, he simply puts the crosshairs over it and keeps them there in the vertical dive until the bomb is released. The Heinkel 111 Schnell bomber was the backbone of every German Blitz bombing effort. It was limited to 4,500 pounds of bombs carried internally, and at the expense of range and speed, it could increase this to a further 4,000 pounds of bombs carried externally. But these bombs were used to support blitzkrieg attacks, 
either as terror bombing for civilians or to hit military targets in a specific way. The fact that the Schnell bomber was never intended as a strategic bomber is borne out by its local defence of only three machine guns. The Schnell bomber used technology which was very little different from the Gotha bombers that had been used in the 1914-18 war. Only its speed at approaching 300 miles per hour made it different from the earlier Gothas. The German Luftwaffe does make early use of radio technology to improve its bombing navigation and the point of bomb release, however. The system sets up a transmitter beam over the target area. When the aircraft flies along this beam, it gets a continuous tone in the headphones of the pilot and navigator. If it strays to the left of the beam, the tone becomes a series of dashes, and if it strays to the right, it becomes a series of dots. So the pilot and navigator try to fly along the beam with a continuous tone sounding in their headsets. As the aircraft approaches the target area, a cross beam sends warning signals to the bombardier. He firstly gets timed signals to tell him of the approach to the target, and then a continuous tone to tell him to release his bombs. This system was first used on the 11th of December 1940 to set up a bombing attack on Birmingham. The beam system was called Nickerbine. A Nickerbine controlled the bombers that attacked Coventry. It has long been said that the British could bend the beams and could have avoided this disastrous raid on Coventry. It didn't do so because Sir Winston Churchill didn't want the Germans to know that we had their secret. If this is so, then it was a calculated risk that cost dearly. The night attack on Coventry goes down as the worst night's bombing that had occurred from aerial bombardment up to that point. But it's unlikely that the Coventration was permitted because of a need for secrecy. It's much more likely that the defences were simply taken by surprise. For 69 continuous nights prior to the Coventry raid, the Luftwaffe had bombed London. It's most likely that we just weren't expecting them to drop bombs on Coventry, which had never been attacked previous to this night during the Blitz. And we did interfere with German navigation aids later in the war, and decoy fires were lighted and camouflage tricks were used throughout the war to convince the Germans that they were bombing worthwhile targets when their beams were being bent. But the Germans did use the beams first. And it meant that raids on British cities led to a mood for revenge. From now on, the science of bombing became more and more sophisticated. They have sown the wind, they will reap the whirlwind. But how exactly is the whirlwind to be delivered? At the time of Butt, the RAF is also using World War I type bomb sites. An aircraft flying higher and faster, the CSBS is too simple to be accurate. But Handley Page Hamden's, Bristol Blenheim's and Armstrong Whitworth Whitley's were all equipped with CSBS bomb sites. Once the arithmetic of bombing is understood, it's a simple matter to put glaze over the nose of an aircraft and to position a bomb site for the bomb aimer. But the RAF course setting bomb site, the CSBS, is very little different from those sites used in World War I. 
The cool setting bombsight initially needs to allow for the lead angle to be set for the height and speed of the aircraft so that the bomb's trajectory takes it onto the target area. A sighting bar, an adjustable graduated angle bar, and a mobile foresight, and the bomb is set up. If the aircraft is flying higher or more slowly, the sight angle needs to be reduced because the bomb will not be thrown as far forward. It's not very complicated. You simply allow the target to come into the crosshairs and then you release the bomb. If the aircraft's flying slightly to the right, you can adjust the bomb sight accordingly, or slightly to the left. Again, you can give the pilot instructions to bring the target onto the bomb sight. But it's as simple as that. Also, for a given wind direction and speed, the sight can be offset to allow for the drift of the bomb. Imagine there is a wind coming onto the nose at 45 degrees, then the correction required is simply equal and opposite. Drop the bombs as it passes the crosshairs and the target should be hit accurately. Air Marshal Portal, as head of Bomber Command, decides that bombers should fly together as a bomber stream in an effort to overpower the enemy's defences. That's the first improvement that Bomber Command makes to its attack on Germany. Portal also introduces the idea of area bombing, which meant that bombing towns and cities rather than trying to hit individual factories. The theory was that if factory workers were made homeless, the factory will have to close anyway. Unfortunately, making factory workers homeless often meant killing them. As the bombers develop into real heavyweights, the tactics improve. Navigation and bombing also get some help. Pathfinder squadrons are formed with the best navigators in the crews to navigate and find the targets in Germany by dead reckoning or using some of the early navigation supports. These aircraft fly lower over the target area to be bombed and the Pathfinder bomb aimers using more carefully calculated bomb aiming factors to accurately bomb flares and incendiaries onto the target area. The bomber stream can then bomb onto the markers. Also from 1942 onwards, Britain and the Royal Air Force began to build up a considerable force of heavy bombers. Among these was the Vickers Wellington which had been designed and introduced in 1936, but it continues in frontline strategic bomber service until 1944. Its geodetric construction means that it could survive severe battle damage, and in its various modified versions, it serves on with coastal command until well after the armistice. But it's the introduction of the four engine heavies that makes the greatest difference. And the first of these is the short Sterling. This aircraft is limited in its performance because the Air Ministry specification required a wingspan of less than 100 feet so that it could fit into the hangars which were built on most of Bomber Command's aerodromes at that time. The 100 feet limit on wingspan meant that the aircraft was limited both in altitude and bomb carrying capacity, 
but it was soon followed by the Handley Page Halifax, which did not suffer from these restrictions. And then came the ultimate heavy bomber of the European war, the Avro Lancaster. With a force building, Air Marshal Arthur Harris, as Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command, championed the saturation bombing of the Nazi state. Often, in the second half of the war, more than 1,000 bombing aircraft could be assembled over the target area. Harris also asked the scientists at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough to investigate a bomb site that used similar mechanical processes as did the Admiralty's fire control table. The fire control table was found in the base of most heavy battleships and it allowed a ship to land heavy shells on another ship up to 15,000 or even 20,000 yards away when both were moving on variable courses at variable speeds. The fire control table used only cogs, gears and helical drives to achieve its accuracy. Farnborough devised the Mark 14 bombsite in two parts. A mechanical analogue computer was usually positioned at the side of the nose compartment and that calculated site settings based on wind drift, size and weight of bombs and the time the bombs would take to drop. The results are then fed into the bomb site itself which was located in the front of the nose compartment with a view of the target. These two things together massively improved bombing accuracy. Initially, the Mark 14 bomb site is fitted to the pathfinders to help accurate target marking. But gradually, as more bomb sites come online, they equip all the precision bombers of the Royal Air Force. The RAF also benefits from a navigational assist, which is called G. A transmitter in the south of England which is referred to as the CAT, puts a hyperbolic track over the continent that intersects with the target area. When the bomber picks up this track, it can fly down and be guided onto the target. If it flies inside the arc, the noise becomes dots. If it flies outside the arc, the noise becomes dashes. But when it flies along the arc, a continuous tone can be heard inside the aircraft. Another transmitter, which is referred to as the mouse, then transmits a signal that gives the bomber warning of its approach to the target and an actual signal when it's time to release the bombs. The limiting factor of G and Oboe is that the radio beams travel in straight lines and the Earth is curved. So as the G curve reaches further and further into Europe, the aircraft are actually flying below the signal. To counteract this, Pathfinder Mosquitoes flew very high to pick up the beams and then dived onto the target and marked it. Then came the target radar originally designated as BN or blind navigation, but quickly became H2S. H2S was a targeting radar system that was based on the S band. It's the bulge underneath bomber aircraft, which contains the H2S radar scanners. S-Band was developed to help destroyers pick up submarines in the Atlantic, but it was quickly adapted for use in aircraft. Inside the H2S dome, 
is a radar scanner and this gives a picture on a display inside the aircraft that shows the ground over which the aircraft is flying with coastlines and cities showing up brightly against a dark background. It gives a view that is not affected by cloud or overcast so even flying above heavy cloud the bomber still knows where it is and what ground it's flying over. Indeed as H2S definitions improved it went beyond the war as a bombing aid for the first Canberra jet bombers. And finally came the Stabilised Automatic Bombsite or SABS. This was the Royal Air Force bombsite that was used in small numbers during World War II. It passed on into post-war applications in the Avro Lincoln, the Canberra bomber and even the early V bombers as they came into service. The SABS is based on tachometric principles similar to those used by the more famous Norden bombsite that was used by the United States Army Air Force. But SABS is much simpler. It was not fitted with the autopilot feature that made the Norden site so complex. Before the war's end, the SAB site could bomb within 30 feet of the target from a height of 20,000 feet. This meant that targets as small as a battleship or a railway bridge, 30 to 40 feet wide, could be hit consistently by bombs dropped from 20 to 30,000 feet. There's another short video at the end of this one that explains some of the complexities of strategic bombing at this time. By 1943, the Germans had also installed ground-based radar stations that formed aerial detection trains across most of the country. With belts of radar-controlled anti-aircraft batteries protecting the frontiers and anti-aircraft batteries defending key cities of the Reich. From July of 1943, that's the date of Operation Gomorrah, which is the subject of another video, the Royal Air Force were cleared to use window. This was nothing more than bundles of aluminium strips that had been cut to the wavelength of the enemy radar. These strips, when thrown out of the aircraft, burst into shimmering clouds. The enemy radar was completely blinded by the spoof returns that these clouds presented. No effective countermeasure was found other than changing the wavelengths of the radar emissions. And this was not an easy matter. In fact, even today, modern aircraft will throw out chaff and flares to distract enemy radar guided and heat seeking missiles. Some aircraft also had a rear-facing S-band radar to assist the rear gunner in locating any attacking fighters. Seemed like a good idea at the time. But the problem was that some night fighters could pick up the signal and fly along the beam and this gave them a perfect attack position. So many rear gunners switched their radar off and relied on the Mark I eyeball. From 1943, the bomber really was getting through, and most of the bombs fell on the target area. The butt report was becoming totally irrelevant. And as the bomber offensive progressed, more and more electronic devices came online to assist navigation and bomb aiming. 
specialist bombers also began to carry devices to detect and counter the enemy's electronic defences. Unfortunately, these devices did not guarantee the safety of the night raiders, however. The Royal Air Force bombers suffered terribly from night fighters that were equipped with airborne radar and heavy cannon weapons. These were often fighter bombers or bombers that were converted to the night fighter role. They took over stalking the bomber because they could carry the heavy airborne radar equipment needed to locate the bombers and the multiple cannons needed to bring them down. There were also opportunities for single seat fighters to fly within the bomber stream in Vildasal while bore missions. They could pick up targets of opportunity that were illuminated in the moonlight or in searchlight beams. And RAF bombers rarely had any defences underneath, and this led to the Germans using Schreger music. Fighters equipped with upward firing cannons that looked somewhat like organ pipes flew unseen underneath the bomber and then fired up into its wings and fuel tanks, bringing it down. There are some thoughts that the fighters used to fire into the fuselage, but they quickly discovered that if you hit the bombs, they might explode and that would take the fighter down as well so they usually contented themselves to set the bomber on fire. The Royal Air Force, flying at night, did not have escort fighters, though sometimes bow fighter and mosquito night fighters flew ahead of the bomber stream, patrolling for enemy night fighters. These intruder fighters used modified versions of the S-band radar to pick up the Messerschmitts, Junkers and Dornier night fighters and shoot them down before the bombers arrived. Their exceptional night vision was put down to eating lots of carrots. The Royal Air Force eventually reached a time when they could fly bombing missions during daylight. The Allies gained total air superiority over much of Germany, with fuel shortages and battle pressures keeping the Luftwaffe on the ground. It was during this period that 617 Squadron and 9 Squadron of the Royal Air Force carried Barnes Wallace's new weapons. Barnes Wallace had invented the Tall Boy and the Grand Slam deep penetration bombs. These bombs fell at supersonic speed and the fins made them spin like rifle bullets. Both types could penetrate armour and concrete that was several feet thick. This meant that by using the SABS bombsite to get the required accuracy from great heights, the Turpits were sunk, various viaducts were knocked down, submarine pens were blown up at La Rochelle, and V-weapon sites buried deep in the ground were also destroyed. But most of Bomber Command was still saturation bombing city areas. They bombed at night to create maximum devastation and loss of life. In an effort to break the morale of the German people and bring about an end to the war. By now, city busting was a scientifically planned assault to maximize casualty figures and damage to property. So how was this assault planned? Firstly, a wave of aircraft flew over, bombing with light 200 pound and 500 pound bombs to destroy buildings, knocking out the roofs, damaging the walls, blowing out windows, 
and blowing out doors. These half-ruined buildings became perfect targets for the next wave, which dropped incendiary bombs to start fires. With any degree of luck, these fires would develop into a firestorm, drawing in oxygen from the surrounding areas and creating conditions that it was almost impossible to live in. As the fires died back and rescue workers and firefighters began to emerge, another wave of bombers came over and dropped light anti-personnel bombs and the occasional heavy landmine. By now, the city was a smoking ruin, but as the smoke cleared, a reconnaissance aircraft flew over to take a photograph. And this photograph shows the total devastation that could be achieved. This is a photograph of Dresden after the raids that took place on the 13th to the 15th of February 1945. 25,000 people were killed in these raids. The raid was demanded by Stalin, who said that Russian immigrants who had been fighting on the German side were escaping the Russian army by going through the city of Dresden. Winston Churchill approved the raid and passed orders to RAF Bomber Command that Dresden should be bombed. The Americans also supported the raid and Jimmy Doolittle, who at that time was Commander-in-Chief of the 8th Army Air Force, suggested that they could join in the raid by bombing Dresden during the day and the final attack orders were down to Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris. Dresden was a raid too far. Stalin denied all knowledge of a request to bomb the city. Churchill suggested that Harris had gone too far in his planning of the aerial campaign. Jimmy Doolittle said that a better method could have been found had he had been more involved in the planning of the mission. Air Marshal Harris carried the international blame for the bombing of Dresden. He was left almost alone to defend the crews of Bomber Command at the end of the war for what they had given towards the victory. By VE Day, Bomber Command were being accused of terror bombing. The disgraceful defacement of Harris's statue in London simply demonstrates that many of the current generation do not understand their history. It's a disgrace that we had to wait so long for a memorial to be set up for Bomber Command and there has never been a campaign medal issued for those men who flew over Germany. Most of the responsibility for this is with dear old Winnie, who towards the end of the war became the arch politician. We've come a long way since Mr Butt's report. The problem is that with modern weapons you don't actually need to hit the target. A five mile miss is plenty close enough. Hopefully bombers have gone out of existence. In April 1968 Bomber Command went out of existence when it merged with Fighter Command. And together they became the RAF Strike Command. By now, all the original RAF commands 
have been merged as groups under Strike Command. There's another program that accompanies this that covers the strategic bombing in World War II as a quick guide to the techniques and the philosophies of Allied bombing in Europe and the Pacific. But that pretty much concludes my histories of RAF Bomber Command. I hope you found them informative, or at least that you will catch up with them later. We have plans to do some shorter local history programmes as well. I'm aiming to put 20 titles in the library before the end of lockdown. All of those can be found by looking for Muscombe History Group in YouTube's search engine. In the meantime, stay safe, stay secure, stay shielded, stay healthy. All being well, we will be meeting here again when we are able. Make sure that you can be here with us. Make sure you are here with us. But not too soon, eh? Goodbye now. <laughs>